Unfortunately, Jen can't be with us recording this month due to a double bereavement. A close member of her family died this week and also a close friend, Chris Duffield, who got ill in China. The Foreign Office have told his family that the ballpark figure for getting him home will be between £5,000 and £20,000. If you'd like to help repatriate the friend's body, please do consider giving a donation to the GoFundMe account at tiny.cc oblique stroke LPVGDZ. Hello and welcome to episode 88 part 1 of Awesome Astronomy for October 2019. We often look upon the infinite cosmos with a sense of awe and wonder that reduces us to insignificance at the scale of it all. In so many ways, we share the view of older astronomers who viewed the cosmos as constant and unchanging, a place far older and more ancient than ourselves, a place where our human view of time is meaninglessly brief and unseen in the heavens. But occasionally, we are reminded that the sky is not so different, that the brief, shining brilliance of human life is reflected back at us in the hundred million supernovae that occur across the observable universe each day, releasing energy unimagined signalling the end of so much, returning to the cosmos what is ultimately only borrowed. Or the flash of dust falling into our atmosphere to burn for a moment as the brightest thing in the sky, a colourful blazing trail that for a moment burns its journey into our sensitive eyes, upsets the constancy of the constellations and delights us beyond measure before fading forever, leaving us looking once again at the infinite. Billions of years, billions of miles, an existence within this glorious universe gone in a moment, we aren't so different to it all. God, that was beautiful. A hundred million supernovae I know, it's every good, day. It? Yeah, isn't it just? Is that right? Yeah, Wowza. yeah. <laughs> it's not just astronomy on this. You learn something too. You do. You do so much learning, as Jenny would say. Um, so, hello. It's me again. I'm, I'm, I'm hosting again, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> We're kind of co-hosting this one, aren't we? We're, uh, we are. We're giving Jen a bit of a break while she deals with uh, more important matters. Yeah. Um, so sadly, uh, uh, for the Jen fans out there, it's just Paul and me. Yeah, I mean, we can we can do our best Welsh. Hello! 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 Tidy! No, it's not going to work. Um, <laughs> I feel like we should need someone to berate us every so often. It's, I know. <laughs> well, John will come in and berate us. Yeah, and, and, and even Damien's here. He is. He is. We've got a Jen substitute. We've got a Jen substitute. He's bearded, um, more than twice the age, but hey. But he's just as beautiful. Yeah, exactly. So we were lucky to see him all weekend, and now we're seeing him again. And the reason for that is because it was Astro Camp last weekend. He is. And it, uh, yeah. quite a mixed bag, wasn't it? It was. And I, just, I don't feel like I can talk very much about it because I had my shortest Astro Camp ever. Oh, that's right. You only came for the day, didn't you? I did come for the day. <laughs> uh, I couldn't talk. You weren't very well. It's a shame you've not still got that voice. You were sounding incredibly sexy. Oh, I, I was. I was. Was it by by Friday when you guys swung by to pick up the stuff mm. to from me? I was all all fostrop, which yep. the English listeners will know what I mean by that. Mm. By Saturday, I was. I was Richard Burton. You were. I was very Richard Burton. Um, yeah, God. By the Wednesday before, I couldn't even speak. Couldn't even speak. I, I literally, not a word would come out of my mouth. I, I was, yeah, which is very rare for me. But, but I could not speak. So, yeah, but I, I was there. For, and Gav's talk. Oh, that was good. Gavin Price, who listeners oh. will remember, was on the show uh, a while back when we were, t I think we were talking about Apollo then, certainly talking about the American space program. And Gav came along to give a talk. If you can't be good, no, if you can't, yes, if you can't be good, be Apollo, which is obviously a reference to the, the um, Pete Conrad quote about if you can't be good, be colourful. And mm. yes, uh, we, we had, for the 50th anniversary of uh, the moon landing, we wanted to make this an Apollo-themed astro camp. So who else were we going to get but Gav to give a talk? And, oh, and what a talk it was. <laughs> oh, well, I think you described it as you, you it finished. You just looked at me and went, that was pure Apollo porn. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's just you look you look like you're about to break out a fag and yeah. sit back and just enjoy enjoy the moment. It was it, we've had some fantastic talks at camp. Yeah. We've had some really brilliant talks, but that was yeah, excellent. That was yeah. such a brilliant I mean somebody who knew their stuff inside out. Just just 
I, I always admire someone who really, really knows their subject yeah. so well, but then can talk about it in a really, really interesting way. To relate f- it in a way that is interesting. Yeah, um, and a funny way. Yeah. I mean, there, there was brilliant humour, really, really good. And do you know what? That was basically the first first proper talk like that he's ever done. Incredible. Brilliant. What a yeah. way to... What a way to, to Get out of the starting blocks. Yeah, just maybe, brilliant. Maybe a, a, a lesson for for all of us, really. Avoid all the stuff that everybody knows, um, and just go for mm. the obscure. Go for the, uh, the 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 humanity. Go for the human angle, and um, and yeah, everyone was eating out of his hand there. It was brilliant. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I, I loved. It. I mean, I learned every, every few minutes. I was learning something new. There, there was stuff in there. I I didn't know that charlie duke story how amazing oh. was that I, we've interviewed the guy we've read his book i thought i knew pretty much everything about apollo i had no idea about that so gavin informed us that charlie duke is a twin didn't even know that and when charlie duke was on the moon he got his brother his twin identical twin brother went into mission control Hmm. Um, and just just to give everybody a fright, um, which uh, afterwards speaking with uh, with his partner Becky, uh, we decided that that's something that's probably best that um, that people don't know about because otherwise it'll just fuel conspiracy theories that they never actually <laughs> won. <laughs> but I mean, what a brilliant moment! Imagine they're sitting there. You you don't know he's a twin, <laughs> an identical twin, and you look up from you're looking at him on the screen, bouncing away in in, in the helmet on the moon, <laughs> and you look back and go, "What the actual?" So like, who is that actually on the moon? Charlie, could you lift your visor? Who please? the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who the hell's in the suit? <laughs> oh, just brilliant. I mean, fantastic. But what a talk. Just yeah. just brilliant. I mean, I, I say I managed to peel myself off, off my deathbed for a day, <laughs> he says, milking it. Yeah. Um, but I was so glad I came down to, to see that tour. That was fantastic. And that kind of made up for what was probably the worst weather we've ever had at camp as well. Well, I don't know. We did have one complete washout. Did we? Well, where yeah, we had was, no nights of clear skies. We had, well, I think we had about 30 minutes. Oh, right. Which which meant we, our clear skies guarantee was fine. <laughs> but I think there was one. Do you And the, the water actually came down the road and stuff like that. It was like... Oh, that's it, a while it, ago it, now, isn't it? Yeah, it was a long while ago now. This, is fif- this was 15 camps, this is. 15. We must be due a break. I know. Oh God, did you know? I, I, I used to have I used to have hair and like <laughs> stuff when I was yeah. I John mean, used to have hair. John, John, John used to be still a bit school when we started this. <laughs> um, yeah, I. But oh God, it was yeah, it was pretty miserable weather, wasn't it? I think everyone who came early had a really great week because it was that it was that inevitability of a sort of brilliant week, wasn't it, leading up to it? Yeah, they said they'd had clear nights for the whole week leading up to it, including yeah. the Friday night that preceded camp, and then after yeah. that there was just so much rain. So I think the the Friday night when we got there, it was perfect skies. The Saturday night, which was the first night of camp you were kind of looking at bits through the clouds um, and then um, Sunday night there was just the odd slight break although uh, you you weren't you wouldn't have been there to see it you're probably on your drive on the way home at that point but we were looking up at the sky and we were seeing breaks in the clouds where you could actually see the Milky Way through the breaks in the clouds oh. in, in like a small window it was so it, clear between those breaks it was one of those I got home so I went home Sunday night um, and when I got back here to Wiltshire, which is only sort of an hour and a half away, the sky here was, com- as, as as ever happens, it was completely clear here. Completely. And it was, because it had been raining all day, it was beautifully clear. Just that the sky had been scrubbed clean. It was just beautiful. Mm. Um, but it didn't last here. I mean, it, it did cloud over quite quickly. But, um, yeah, it was beautiful. And I know John was up late. He was. And, and got some clear skies again. Got some. It was one of those the the usual thing at Astra Camp. Yeah, be, be patient, and he got a good couple of hours in. Mm. So, yeah, no, it was, it was good. I mean, I think people had fun. It it was a it, the say the quiz was always good fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and a, a young first timer got their their first telescope as a prize uh, as an act of um, of generosity as well because the the actual winners of the beginners prize um, didn't need another telescope um, mm. and they gave it away to one of the excited uh, youngsters that was there and wow was he excited he was oh. a, a, a kid called Ashton and he was beside himself with getting a, uh, his first telescope as a as a prize oh. in the quiz 
I mean that that he he got he got the the, the one of the you know the first scopes I ever had, and I was an adult when I got that scope. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, to to be that young and, and be given it was it was a one two seven Mac. I mean, just brilliant. I Perfect. mean, he, yeah. Uh, that, 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 and that's what Astrid Camp's all about. And that, yeah. that's, that's what warms the cockles. Yeah. So, so moving on to uh, important mm. matters. You might remember in I think it was the last show or the, the last astronomy show, I'm not quite sure. But we, um, well, I think it was Jenny that gave a, um, uh, a news story that was talking about pet instability supernovae. These that's are, right. These are the ones that are so large um, and so energetic that they convert a lot of the matter into antimatter, which annihilates with the normal matter and leaves absolutely nothing behind yeah, yeah so we were we were asking you to send in your suggestions for uh better names for it than a pet instability supernova you know when you've got words names out there like supernova and magnetar you've got to have a better name than pet instability supernova for something that's so massive it leaves nothing behind uh so we we had a few suggestions before I move on, Paul, have you any idea what Kevin Morgan's talking about by calling it pissers or piss stars? <laughs> I I have a feeling that's more a reference to us. Uh, but but yeah, I I yeah, pissers or or piss stars. Yeah. Uh, well, I suppose they're pissing it all up against the wall, aren't they? I suppose. But <laughs> um, I, I I have a fee I have a feeling that the uh, the uh, the rather um, naughty air traffic controller from. Um, <laughs> Is, is is having a little dig at, um, at us there? Oh, okay, well that's fair enough then. Um, but uh, we did have some really astounding suggestions. So mm. Marcel Jan Kriegsman, I'm assuming his name is, suggests a vanish star, which is that's, very that's good. good. That's good. Um, Peter Coates, but probably not that one. Suggests no, probably not that one. Annihilator. That's good. That is good, isn't it? That's good. I could, I could, I could see myself standing in front of people talking about annihilator, uh, yeah. annihilators. Yeah, a pulsar, a magnetar, and an annihilator. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. So keep sending them in, and we'll find out who it is that actually decides on the names of astronomical phenomena. I'm assuming it's not the International Astronomical Society. It's probably the researchers that that come up with the idea. Um, But we'll find out who it is, and we'll see if we can get them to adopt whichever's the best one. Because I think if they get presented with a name that's as cool as as, as you're coming out with now, and it's going to be something that's going to be remembered, and probably get them into the press as well, they'll be well up for changing the name of of, or giving it a, uh, a new name. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Or we, what we do is just bypass them and go straight to the popular press. Yeah, yeah. And tell them that's what it's called. Yeah, because they they'll take any old shit. Of course the, they the, will. The popular press. Yeah, yeah. So, and then, and then we'll have made it happen. Yeah. Well, just one of us needs to get on to to like a BBC or something and just just say it and say, well, we, we these are normally called, boom, and it'll be. It, and so it will be. Hmm. Well, that's enough lightheartedness and froth. It's time to pay attention and expand your horizons as we take a look at the things we know about our universe that we didn't just a month ago. And it's a rich seam of knowledge we tap into this month. So, Paul, what have you got for us? Okay, well, uh, my first story is an exoplanet story. It was like an exoplanet story. Um, And this is different to the usual fare. Um, so usually we're getting all excited about atmospheres and you often hear us getting all excited about the prospect of next generation scopes, being able to look at the atmospheres and what's in them and you know, the search for life and water and all this. Um, and more about that later. But here we have something completely different. Um, what's been dubbed a naked planet, uh, which is one with no atmosphere. So much like our own Mercury. Hmm. Um, and... This is the first exoplanet to be to be to have it demonstrated as such. So, um, LHS three eight four four B, snappy title, um, which is forty eight point six light years away, so not that far in the big scheme of things. Um, so it's in it's within the sort of local local area of, of sky. Uh, it was found in two thousand eighteen by the TES, um, and it was follow up observations by Spitzer and a team at Harvard led by uh, Laura Kreiberg. Oh, BBC political correspondent, Laura Koonsberg. <laughs> I don't mention her at the moment. <laughs> um, it's revealed that it's tidally locked 
uh, it's a tightly locked rocky world where with massive surface temperature variations so on the side that's permanently facing its red dwarf host uh, which it orbits every 11 hours by the way so it's really close oh yeah um it's thought to have a temperature of 1040 kelvin that's quite steep what's that's mercury quite, at that's quite toasty um a lot less mm. because mercury's a lot further out I mean, Mercury takes 88 days to go around the sun, which is a bigger star. 801 Fahrenheit. So that's significantly warmer. Yeah. I mean, it was in the popular press, they were reporting sort of 770 degrees Celsius was mm. the kind of figure that was bounded around. But actually, if you, if you delve into the paper, they talk about um, a maximum temperature of 1,040 Kelvin. Um, and then, of course, you've got the nighttime side, which, of course, is permanently nighttime side because it's a tiny locked planet. Um is close to zero Kelvin. So Kreiberg herself says, you know, th this huge temperature variation is a real big indication that this this body has no atmosphere because there's no way of spreading the thermal energy around the planet. Uh -huh. So you think of something like Venus, um, which, while not completely tidally locked, rotates very slowly. Um, the The temperature around Venus is much more even because the weather essentially spreads the energy around. Mm. Um, Mercury, of course, although it, it rotates, um, whereas this one doesn't as such, although it, it does rotate, but not in it. Um, it's always got one face that's facing the sun, one yeah. side that's facing the um, star. So much, much like the moon mm. yeah. is to Earth. Um, this, um, you know, Mercury is, is very hot on its daytime side and very cold on its nighttime side. So this this is this to the extreme in that whereas Mercury does rotate, so all sides eventually become the nighttime side. Um, this does rotate, but it rotates in the same period its orbit. So um, it's it's hot side, one thousand forty Kelvin. It's just incredible. Mm. Um, it's thought to be two point two five times uh, the mass of Earth, with a radius a third bigger than the Earth. And albedo um, from the readings, it looks so it's it's actually similar to Mercury. It's giving a similar build albedo uh, Mercury. Uh, sort of rating to Mercury or the Moon. Did you just say uh, libido then? A libido. It's got a libido. <laughs> Sexy planet. Sexy planet. I mean, it's hot. 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 Um, but yeah, its albedo reading is is similar to Mercury or, or the Moon, So, which would suggest it, it it may well look a lot like the Mercury or Moon because it's sort of similar. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so this is in nature, if you want to delve into that uh, a bit further. Next up, ammonia on Jupiter. Um, so yes, it sounds like the kind of talk you'd avoid at a conference, um, <laughs> but hold on, this is actually quite interesting. So using six of the Earth's most powerful telescopes, so just purely on, a, on the base of how it's done, it's interesting. Using six of the Earth's most powerful telescopes, a team's explored and potentially explained what drives those plume-like storms you see on Jupiter. Um, so um, picture Jupiter, you see those distinctive stripes, you've got the white zones and the brown-red coloured belts. Mm. Um, and of course you see in those belts you see those little eruptions of storms yeah. and things like that um, so um, the zones are the areas of Jupiter's clouds that are rich in ammonia that's why they're white um, but it's the dark belts the way you see those storms erupting you get this sudden appearance of these sort of little white blobs um, and you get this sort of sudden appearance of ammonia um, and it appears to generate lightning as well so this is sort of storms like on earth so using ALMA, which is, of course, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, um, the VLA, the Gemini, the Keck, the Subaru, and the Hubble. Wow, they are bringing out all the big hitters. I know. It, it, was, it, was, it, it is that, that sort of, what's it, the Matrix, you know, where they open up the bag with all the guns in. <laughs> it, it, it's like the astronomy equivalent yeah. of that. So what do you, what do you bring into this paper? Well, <laughs> <laughs> well done getting all that, that sky time, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, do you know what? I thought that. Then I saw it was um, Berkeley that had, that had yeah. done it. I was like, ah, well, yeah, okay, of course they did. Um, but yeah, I was like, wow. You know, they, when I started reading this, like, you, you got time on all these scopes. Good God. But anyway, um, so it's a team at Berkeley that were able to build up a broad picture using all these scopes of what happens when one of these plumes appears. Um, and actually, it was an amateur astronomer that, that spotted the plume that they then started examining. Yeah. So there was a sort of amateur... Um, as ever, amateurs constantly looking mm -hmm. at Jupiter. 
bit of bit of sort of input there. So Alma was the crucial bit of kit uh, here because it was able to penetrate the upper cloud layers and see further into Jupiter and thus build this sort of 3D picture of these storms. Um, and what is finding? Well, there is a layer of water about 80 kilometers down. Turns out um, it's an area where water vapor condenses out. Um, and it's in this condensation that, that is, is the key, basically, because heat's released in that process of condensation. And this warms the falling air, which then rapidly rises up through the cloud layers um, and goes right up through the clouds into the tropopause, which, of course, is the, the coldest layer of the atmosphere. Um, and there, ammonia that's been picked up by this sort of rise, it sort of scoops up the ammonia, um, freezes into to ice crystals and forms an anvil-shaped cloud. That might sound very familiar. Mm -hmm. Uh, see those bright storm belt, the sort of those bright storms forming in the belt. Um, so in short, think cumulonimbus on Earth, fast rising, warm, moist air heating. Um, this whole process is called moist convection, which is, is the process that creates things like cumulonimbus clouds. Um, to get fast rising, warm, moist air heating, cold upper layers, and, and forming sort of forming violent storms. So in Jupiter's case, it's filled with ammonia. Um, so now you know what you're seeing possibly in the, the telescope next time you see these storms forming on the king. Mm. Um, so if you want to follow that up, that was in the Astronomical Journal. Um, the lead author is Imk de Pata. Um, so next for me um, is Gaia, the quiet warrior of astrometrics. Mm. Um, it's constantly changing the way we see the universe. Well, ESA's spinning observatory is at it again, and this time providing data that has shown what happens to stars after they leave their birth sites. So now you may be aware that stars form together in open clusters and then generally over time it's thought that stars sort of disperse and go their own way essentially. Uh, we've known for a while that there are co-moving groups um, where group stars spread out and appear to move together. Um, the Plough is a famous example. Uh, it's known as the Ursa Major moving group, co-moving group. Um, but this data uh, and a study of it by a team led by Dr. Marina Kuhnkel uh, of the Western Washington University have shown that this co-moving group idea is common and perhaps the norm and that stars on leaving a cluster don't immediately lose touch with their siblings but spread out into co-moving chains. Um, they identified 2,000 such chains within 3,000 light years of Earth. Uh, which isn't that far, really, in the big scheme of mm. things. You think how many stars are actually spread out 3,000 light years. It, it's not as many as you think. Um, and they also observed that young chains tend to be orientated at right angles to the galactic plane, while older groups were strung out parallel oh. to the galactic plane. So it's thought that by studying the older chains, we might get an insight into the issues we talked about with Professor Karen Masters uh, a few months ago. Um, about the nature of spiral arms and whether they're permanent density waves or transient features because the results suggest that motions within the galaxy change the nature of these co-moving groups. Um, so that was also in Astronomical Journal um, if you wanted a deeper read on that. But I just thought that was very interesting, this idea that you know we, we kind of think of stars spreading out from their, their clusters, but actually they, they seem to, especially over the first few billion years, stick together. We know more about the universe now until we find out that's not the case, and then we'll know more about it again. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So um, next, it's uh, Chandra. Hot off the press. Hot off the press, this is this is released today. Um, this is the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and it's been looking at a, a, a system called SDS J084905.51 plus 11114474.2. Oh, catchy. I know, I know. Remember it, there'll be a test later. <laughs> um, it's a billion light years from Earth, so nearby. Um, and it is found, it's, it's three colliding galaxies. And this was really, what's really interesting, first of all, is this was picked up by Galaxy Zoo. Oh. So this is initially citizen science. So this, this odd looking um, galaxy, and if you look it up, um, you'll see this, this sort of fantastic picture of three colliding galaxies, and it's a really odd looking thing um, looks like a, a fidget spinner if you look at the picture and what they discovered is in its center there are three supermassive black holes essentially orbiting each other which is awesome you still there yep oh sorry i, I was i was expecting more awesome than that oh oh there we go <laughs> <laughs> sorry i just I thought oh, he's got out of the room um <laughs> 
so the data, uh, the, the Chandra data has revealed three bright X-ray sources um, that there's, which is the, the kind of te- we now know is a sort of telltale signature of that that kind of black holes feasting on things, um, the, the material falling into black hole and, and, and getting really bright because of course black holes aren't aren't as sort of invisible and dark as we th- mm. initially thought they were, um, and they think this is the, the three supermassive black holes from the centres of each galaxy and they're in the process of a merger. Um, and the separations between these black holes range from between 10,000 and 30,000 light years. So they, these ain't going to merge anytime soon. But of course, with the, the power of the, the, the gravity of these three objects, they're essentially kind of moving around each other. So this is a, a sort of a triple system of black, supermassive black holes interacting with each other, which is pretty cool. Pretty damn cool. It's pretty damn cool. Uh, and that's from the George Mason University in Fairfax, is the paper. Um, I say that that's hot off the press hot. today. Hot, hot, hot off the press, if you wanted to follow that up. Um, and then my last little ditty is just the most left field thing ever, which um, I saw. Oh, no, this isn't what you sent to us on the Kushner back oh, channel, it is it? It completely is. Oh, it, don't. It completely do it. is. It was. It, it, I've just mentioned it because it's so bonkers, it's brilliant. It appeared on Archive just this afternoon. Um, and this is the most nuts idea. It's just brilliant, but it's one of those where you suddenly go like, oh yeah, but it would be cool if it was true. <laughs> and but it's why entitled... put it out there as a research paper? Oh, anyway, it's being uh, shared... anyway, dear listener, I'll let you judge. Just, right. This is... What if Planet Nine is a primordial black hole? And I'm just going to read you the the initial um, thing. It says, We highlight the anomalous orbits of trans-Neptunian objects and an excess of microlensing events in the five-year Ogle data set can be simultaneously explained by a population of astrophysical bodies with mass several times that of Earth. We take these objects to be primordial black holes, PBHs, and point out that the orbits of TNOs would be altered if one of these PBHs was captured by the solar system in line with the Planet Nine hypothesis. Capture of a free-floating planet is a leading explanation for the origin of Planet Nine, and we show that the probability of capturing a PBH instead is comparable. I just no. I I I loved the idea that it's just so left field and nuts that there's a little tiny black hole basically in orbit around the sun, and I, I thought that was hilarious. And we'll um, leave it there. But the best <laughs> best part of the paper is that they put it's like someone on Twitter oh, said this yeah. evening. It's the like graphic. top le- top level academic trolling. They've put a one to one scale picture of this primordial black hole in the paper. Because of course it would be about the size of a bowling ball. Yeah, and as and we can... all know from Stephen Hawking, that due to Hawking radiation, it would last a fraction of a second at that size because it would just uh, evaporate. Exactly, it's just it's just completely it's completely bonkers, and it was silly, and it's been shared around Twitter this evening, so it just made me laugh. And I thought I'm just gonna put that in because everyone's sort of twittering on about Planet Nine, and I just love the idea it was a primordial black hole. <laughs> and there we are, <laughs> it's been given some sunlight on this show, and we shall speak of it no more. We shall speak of it no more, but I just thought that was funny. That just made me laugh. There we go. <laughs> I'm done. Okay, uh, so my first news story begins on the 29th of August this year, when an amateur astronomer in Crimea called Gennady Borisov was using his homemade telescope with an impressive 25 and a half inch mirror in his personal observatory and found an object moving from Perseus towards Cassiopeia, slightly different than the plane of the main asteroids. So Borisov checked the coordinates and compared them to the minor planet centres and found it was a new object, slightly diffuse, so likely a comet, and it also appeared to be on a near-Earth trajectory. So Borisov posted it on the World webpage for confirmation of dangerous objects. At this point, the comet was three astronomical units from the sun, so three times the Earth-sun distance. And calculations of the orbit showed it to be wildly eccentric in its orbit, so a really oval uh, orbit. Uh, Further calculations showed that it wasn't going to come close enough to the Earth to be registered as a near-Earth object and a collision hazard, but that it was barreling into the solar system at 32 kilometres a second, 
on an orbit with an eccentricity of around 3. Now, bear in mind that anything above an eccentricity of 1 has what's called a hyperbolic trajectory, meaning it can escape the gravitational pull of the Sun and leave the solar system. And that means this comet is a visitor. It came from mm. outside the solar system. And it already has a tail, and it'll reach its closest point to the Sun on the 7th of December this year, when it'll make its way back out of the solar system again, never to be seen. And if you remember back, the only other interstellar object we've ever seen before is asteroid, go on, Paul, in 2017. And that was given the designation 1I 2017U1, where 1I stood for the first interstellar object. And now this comet has been given the International Astronomical designation 2I Borisov. Which is very cool. And if you were wondering if you'll be able to observe it, it reaches its closest point to Earth on the 28th of December, when it'll have risen from a magnitude 17 to mag 15. But as it's a comet, and therefore diffuse, you'll probably need a 16-inch scope or larger to... John! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello? Do you want to see this interstellar comet? You'll be able, you might be able to see it in your 16-inch scope um, just after Christmas Day. I'll put it on my list for Santa. You should do. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, however, <laughs> you'll have to have the constellations of Crater and Corvus high up in the sky, so it's not one for the Northern Hemisphere either. You'll have to take a trip to the Southern Hemisphere, John, or the equator. A trip to us on my Christmas list as well as the... Uh... There you go. <laughs> With... With Bob. Santa will be emptying his sack for you this Christmas. Oh, I love it when Santa empties his sack. I'm not letting Santa fly, Bob. And next up, we have another correction to make to well-accepted astronomical principles. Now, we do this quite regularly as new observations overturn conventional wisdom. And this time, it relates to the evolution of star clusters. Because until recently, it was accepted that globular clusters begin small grow larger by attracting more stars under the effect of its increasing gravity. And as this happens, large, heavy stars sink to the centre of the glob and smaller, lighter stars stay out at the edges and are even capable of escaping the system. This is a process known as dynamic ageing, and it should be repeatable in all globs. But a survey of globular clusters in the Large Magellanic Cloud using the Hubble Space Telescope by researchers at the University of Bologna led to a puzzling observation as the young clusters were all compact, while the oldest systems have both small and large sizes, meaning that age alone doesn't tell the complete story when it comes to the evolution of star clusters. And the leader of the Bologna team, Francesco Ferraro, said, we demonstrated that different structures of star clusters are due to different levels of dynamic aging. They are in different physical shape, despite the fact that they were born at the same cosmic time. This is the first time that the effect of dynamic aging has been measured in the large Magellanic cloud clusters. And it also means that it's, it now can't be assumed that just because you've got a nice, tight, dense cluster of stars in, uh, in a globular cluster, that it means that it's an old, old cluster. So that goes mm. out the window. Well, that, that, well that's, that's, that's a pain in the arse. Hmm. Hmm. And finally for me, we have a nice Martian puzzle brought to us by NASA's InSight mission. So this was the Mars lander that went pretty much largely under the radar last year because it's not a rover and it's not weighted down with high-res cameras. Now instead, it probes the interior of Mars to learn about the geology and composition of the red planet. And while it's been quietly doing this since November last year, we only now have the preliminary science outputs thanks to presentations last month at a joint meeting of the European Planetary Science Congress and the American Astronomical Society. And <laughs> these findings were, were quite the surprise because firstly, the Martian crust is far more powerfully magnetic than scientists expected. Secondly, a peculiar electrically conductive layer about 2.5 miles thick deep beneath the planet's surface suggests there might be a global reservoir of liquid deep beneath the Martian surface. Now, thirdly, the magnetic field near the lander is about 20 times stronger than what had been predicted based on past orbital measurements. Um, and by, cons by uh, extension, if this comes from younger rocks near the surface, that would suggest that Mars's magnetic field lasted longer than previously thought, too. Mm -hmm. But... Perhaps the most surprising of all is that the magnetic field pulses, showing fluctuations in the strength or direction of the magnetic field. And this is known to happen on Earth when there are northern lights, but 
and I don't want to creep anyone out here, these Martian wobbles happen every Martian midnight as if it's responding to the demands of an unseen nocturnal timer. And that's not been seen anywhere before. So now they're going to compare InSight and MAVEN data to see if the orbiting MAVEN spacecraft can suggest a weak atmospheric magnetic bubble effect as a cause of this regular magnetic chirping. Because if not, it's some Martians under the surface that are dicking around with a magnetic field every night. Ralph? Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> that is weird, though, isn't it? Isn't it? That is weird. So they think it might it might be that there's the the way that the magnetic bubble around Mars um, creates a bit of a it's kind of stretched out at the the side that's facing away from the sun into a kind of a bit of a tail, and they're wondering mm. if it might get a little twang at midnight every night, and um, or, or, or a, a Martian midnight anyway. Um, but that's just a hypothesis. But, they don't but, know. But why why would that? Because it would be, but midnight would occur at different points all the way around the surface of Mars. Mm. So, well, well, they they can only measure yeah. it from where Insight is. Yeah. Well, I mean that that explanation seems to suggest then that 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 it happens over that place and that that it's midnight at that spot that's that's the special spot, or is it happening repeatedly every? I, I don't. Mm. Yeah. If I'm remembering right from right from what I read, then I think that is the case that. Uh, Insight lander just happens to be on the po- portion of Mars which sees midnight overhead. Well, everyone sees midnight overhead. Well, you, you know what I mean. That, uh, <laughs> that, that <laughs> sorry, that magnetic <laughs> tail is overhead at midnight every night, and that might be by design. I don't know because you know if you're if you're measure, if you've got magnetometers, there might be a reason why they want to I, be in I, that spot. I have to say, I, I'm confused by that one. I'm going to have to go and read that. Mm. I'm I'm confused because I would have thought the tail is always over midnight because if the tail is pointing away from the sun. Yeah, but the Mars, but the Insight lander is directly beneath that, I believe. Yeah, but it wouldn't be all day. No, directly under the tail. Oh yes, I see what you mean. Because the it, Mars rotates. Yeah. In the same way that it's not midnight here all the time. No. That's what I'm kind of getting. I was like, eh. Go and have a look at it would... and see if you can make it out. Yeah, I'm gonna have to. That's really, really mm. interesting. Yeah. That's 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 oh, fascinating. Cool. So let's now take a look at the big news story this month, and I picked this one less because of how big it is, and rather because of how contentious it is. And that's the discovery of water vapor by Hubble on an Earth-like exoplanet in a habitable zone. So. Astronomers at the Centre for Space Extrochemistry Data at University College used Hubble Space Telescope data to find water vapour in the atmosphere of K218b, Snappy. an exoplanet around a small red dwarf star about 110 light years away in the constellation Leo. Neither UCL nor NASA press release has suggested it as habitable, but some reputable media outlet, and I'm looking at you, BBC, did spice it up with that fabricated nugget. It was a little bit disappointing, actually, to see. This that, was. That yeah. They, uh, yeah, they actually said it, called it a habitable planet rather than it being in the habitable zone, and that's that's a bit lazy of reputable news organisations. He, he was very lazy. I got I got really excited on the day because it was yeah. like, you know, one of those, you sort of, you know, you wake up and you look at the news and you're like, they found a habitable planet. It's got water on it. It, it. Well, this is really interesting. And it didn't take more than sort of 30 seconds of reading the stories even on the BBC go like no yeah what how have they got got this habitable planet yeah it's, just like, it's ridiculous yeah um, and, and this is I mean this story to me goes right to the heart of science communication and how it can be completely missold to the public yes because of course that's what we're looking for we're looking for habitable planets and I think yeah. it's because uh, of the discovery of water vapour in the atmosphere that they put one and one together and not actually read about you know the size of this planet it's a super earth it's kind of neptune sized so yeah it's not going to be habitable there's just too much mass there and um and that there's going to be a huge amount of surface pressure if it has a surface which i think it did mention in there that it was rocky didn't it yes it did yeah. it did um but- and but it's it's this this notion that oh they found water therefore because and this is this is the problem where we we 
the science has been, been selling this, oh, you know, we're looking for water. If we find water, then there's possibility of life. But Jupiter's atmosphere. got water in its atmosphere. But yeah, Venus has got water on it. <laughs> you know, you, you, there's no life on Venus. No. We're it's find a it. hellish world. And, and yeah. so, is, so is Jupiter, if you were living there, too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. There's, there's, there's water. Water's the, I think, what gets... Is, well, it isn't known publicly. Very, very, is that water is one of the most abundant hmm. molecules in the universe? We find it in um, nebulae. Yeah, it's everywhere hmm. because it, it's it's made it's quite stable. Yeah, it's stable, and it's made of two very very common <laughs> um, atoms. I mean, hydrogen's hmm. the most common, and then oxygen. Well, oxygen's made made in in all stars eventually. Hmm. Um, so. There's a lot of oxygen, and yeah, they. Oh, it, it, it was one of those really irritating. Um, I mean, Jen was was hilarious. I, 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 as, as I always wish Jen was here. Um, yeah, she was straight on it. Oh, she, and she was fuming about it, wasn't she? Straight yeah. away, just like this is yeah. ridiculous. Um, yeah, because as soon as I mean, we we kind of shared this on um, on the Cushioner Back channel or Facebook Messenger, um, and when we took a look at the news story, it's quite clear that it's in the habitable zone, but it's not habitable in the remotest, and it's not Earth-like, and water vapor in the atmosphere does not a living planet make. But the final word has to go to Jen because she just summed it up in such a, a, a simple mm. way. She's she just put. It's not habitable for life as we know it because the pressure at the surface is likely to be similar to that at the bottom of the deepest oceans on Earth. And just because there's vapour in the atmosphere doesn't mean there's liquid water. The planet is more likely to be closer to Neptune than Earth. Yeah. Boom. Boom. Exactly. Uh, BBC, sign Jen up. uh, And and certainly bloody should. Uh, Do you know what? There was was a similar story. Well, not similar, but there was a similar incident. Um, The Times, um, their science correspondent, put something out and he, instead of putting solar system, he put galaxy. Oh, yes, that's true. But he came back on Twitter, didn't he, and apologised for it. He did, because all sorts of, including us, we, we sort of called him out. I'm a bloody idiot. But, and this, is, and, it, and this is no sort of, you know, personal smear on, 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 on the gentleman I'm going to name him, but he's the science correspondent. Mm. His degree is in English and, and media. Really? How is he the science correspondent? Exactly. And so often, and this is no slight on him, but he's not he's not got any sort of science background. And he's probably a very fine journalist and a very fine wordsmith. If he's working at the Times, I hope he is. But he's not a scientist. He hasn't got any science background. And this is so common that mm. in, in sort of media outlets, the, the science... I mean... Uh, this is a slight, but his his comment on his Twitter, or, or, or his, uh, I think it was his Twitter, said basically was was a was a this um, now doing dinosaurs and asteroids and stuff, and I think that's actually the attitude that that a lot of of, of media has towards science, that it's oh, it's just dinosaurs and bits of rock and stuff but it's not i mean a basic understanding yeah. of science is needed for all of these things because you know you could so easily be duped by 10 million years and 60 million years you know yeah. you just need to know your stuff it's and, 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 that, and we, that basic basis in science it's so helpful yeah. for being able to tell the truth from the fiction oh and you look at some of the things that have happened I mean, we, we are getting a falling and falling rate of childhood immunization in this country hmm. and it's happening all over and that's because of the really poor reporting that happened actually quite a while ago now, but has, has continued in various ways um, about the whole MMR mm. thing. And that was actually just down to really to bad reporting. Yeah, and people are dying of measles. Even when he said it, I don't want to name the dickhead, frankly, but you know, scientists were calling him out and saying that, that you're wrong, you, you've, you've completely got this wrong. But you've got journalists, most of who weren't scientists, weren't biologists, weren't doctors or anything like that, yep. going, oh, this is a great story. Yep. And just pumping it out and not questioning, yep. going, actually, is this right? And it, it does my head in because, I mean, and this is, this is only talking about, you know, planets and habitability, but, but it's part of a wider malaise in, in sort of science reporting that it's lazy. Yeah. 
and, and it just stuff. means it becomes click fodder and exactly. um, and viral because people get scared by it and people yeah. believe it because why wouldn't you yeah exactly and and on a, on a you know coming back to this story it and we've said this before when i mean nasa's been actually a bit guilty of this of saying like you know finding earth 2 and stuff like that yeah when we actually do find that planet which i'm sure we will at some point we will get one and go like do you know what this this is this is probably the closest we've ever found to a planet that looks like home it's going to happen no one will like either no one will care or no one will believe them because we've heard it that many times with ones that are nothing like earth exactly because you'll say well hang on a minute you said that about the last 10 so why is this important? And we will actually, you know, the, the astronomers will be saying, like, no, this really is the one. This is it. We've actually found the one that looks just like Earth. Yeah. This is this is Earth 2, genuinely. Mm. And no one will give a shit because yeah. we've had this constant kind of crap. And sometimes it's the sign. It, it, it comes from people like, like NASA who have overplayed their hand. But so often it comes from just bad reporting. I'm going to be contentious and say that even when you've got the likes of the extremely large telescope online and the Spitzer Space Telescope, we still won't find an Earth analog in our lifetime. I think that there are Ooh. so many exoplanets out there. Um, we can only take a look at the atmospheres of the nearby-ish ones, even mm. with those mammoth telescopes, and there are so many evolutionary paths that planets can take thousands if not millions of different alternative pathways that i don't think we'll find one in our lifetime i i'm going to go the other way i think we will mm. i think there are so many exoplanet candidates i've got a feeling that we'll find biomarkers for life but it will be yeah. on worlds that aren't like or that aren't earth-like i i i i i think we will we'll get will there will be a i'm i'm confident by the time i'm dribbling in a chair mm. I reckon we will sit there and go do you know what there's a star that star there there's a planet around it that near as damn it is is like here mm. uh, you know, similar similar mass and size and seems to have an atmosphere of water and methane and things like that and we'll go yeah you know, there's, there's one just like Earth I Actually. hope you're right yeah there we go Okay, so now we come on to the Sky Guide, the section for the die-hard amateur astronomers, the section that inspires you to go out and look up, the section that might just inspire you to take a fresh look at an object you've been neglecting for years or never thought to look at at all. So what are you drawing our attention to in the solar system, Paul? Okay, well, as ever with the solar system, it's feast or famine with planets, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Remember those heady days um, of a line of planets across the evening sky? Do you remember that, where you could mm -hmm. you could stand there just just not that long ago? Mm -hmm. You could you could scan across the sky and see them. All. Well, yeah, every looked a planet. Well, that's not October two thousand nineteen. I'm afraid it's not one of those times. Mercury and Venus are in hiding. Mars, you will grab a glimpse if you get up early at the end of the month, just before dawn. Um, Jupiter, has gone into hiding. That's gone as well. Saturn is there just at the start of the month. Then it joins Jupiter, goes into hiding. So all the planets near Earth, they're all gone. Um, and just leave us the ice giants. So you've got Neptune at magnitude 7.8 sitting in Aquarius. That's just past all position. So in terms of you, still pretty much as good as you'll get. And then we have this month's planetary celebrity, Uranus, uh, which reaches opposition on the 28th. Uh, it's sitting in Aries. Um, it's placed really nicely for northern observers high in the sky just under magnitude 6 the moon will be nearby on the 14th as a reference uh, unless you are endowed with magnificent girth <laughs> you're not going to see a great deal other than the small green planetary disc but it's cool nonetheless and you can walk in the footsteps of Herschel mm. the ultimate amateur astronomer to fill in for the frankly appalling show by the big boys and girls why not spend October indulging in that other Herschel pastime comet hunting we have three comets that show promise in October's sky. One is 2018 W2 Africano. Now, this surprise observed a few weeks ago by suddenly brightening more than expected and could well be binocular brightness in October. It's moving south, so grab it early on. As we record at the end of September, it's in the Great Square of Pegasus, moving towards the circle at Pisces, um, then on further south through Aquarius as the month goes on, and then Northern Observer's going to lose it, I'm afraid. Then... 
for the first part of the evening, move on to 2018 N2 Assassin. <laughs> never quite sure how to say that. It's come up before, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think we agreed on Assassin. Yeah, it's uh, one of those crappy acronyms. It looks like they were trying to say Assassin. It's A-S-A-S-S-N, but Assassin. <laughs> um, as it moves through uh, from Triangulum, north of M33, and tracks westwards through the month, moving through Andromeda. Around the 21st, it's near the star Mirac, which, of course, very easy to find, P2 Andromeda. Um, and by a month's end, it's about three degrees south of M31. Uh, it's magnitude 12 at present. Uh, impressive tail for those with medium scopes. You should enjoy this one. Then have a go at 2017 T2 Panstars. Uh, this is a sort of late evening one as it moves from Taurus into Auriga. This means it will be nice and high in the dark skies. At the end of the month, it gives us an Instagram moment as it moves very close to Messier 36. Mm. This comet has also surprised us with its brightness and is already Mag 9 a month ago. Mm. So keep an eye on that one. So three good comets to look for. Ralph? Well, this month I'm going to take a look at some of the great lunar conjunctions on offer. It's a great way for beginners to find planets and an excuse to compare moon phases throughout the month. And we start with nightfall on the 3rd of October, when you can use the moon to pick Jupiter out in the darkening sky. Jupiter sets around 8.30pm in mid-European and American latitudes. It's dark around 7.30pm, but try looking for Jupiter an hour or so earlier by looking one and a half degrees away from the 30% illuminated waxing moon. It should be in the eight o'clock position. A small scope will show fantastic views of Theophilus Crater, and with a medium-sized scope, you may just catch the great red spot on the gas giant in the dusk sky before it rotates out of view around 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. On the night of the 5th of October, we have until 10 p.m. to enjoy a conjunction of the first quarter moon with the ring world Saturn. This phase of the moon gives great views of the Apennine mountain range explored by the Apollo 15 astronauts and the sun creates long shadows to bring them into life in small scopes. You'll be able to find Saturn a degree away from the moon in the 10 o'clock position at 7pm. It'll be the obviously bright star you can see directly above the moon by 9pm. Saturn will show its beautifully tilted rings and the moon Titan to owners of small scopes and a closer line of moons, Rhea, Tethys and Dione, if you have a 5-inch scope or larger. The moon then swings by Jupiter again on the 31st of October. Jupiter sets shortly after 6pm on this day, but it is dark from 5.30pm, so do take a look at the beautiful two-day-old slender crescent moon, one degree to the left of brilliant Jupiter. The Sea of Crises and Endymion Crater will be waiting for small telescope owners, while a double transit of Io and Europa may be visible in larger scopes as the moon's shadows Ooh. cross the surface of Jupiter. Try looking between 4.45pm and its setting at 6.15pm. At this time, you may also catch the great red spot rotating into view, but it will be very low down on the horizon. Next up, we have October's plentiful meteor showers. For all of these, get a chair or a sun lounger facing in the direction of the meteor shower and look patiently about 45 degrees or halfway between the horizon and the zenith. The first is the Draconids peaking on the night of the 9th. This shower is caused by Earth passing through fragments of Comet 21P Jacobini Zinner and varies in numbers of meteors from year to year, but every now and again, without warning, we get a bumpy year of hundreds per hour. Face northwest, ideally after the moon has set around 1pm, and cross your fingers for a bumpy year. Next up is the peak of the Southern Taurids in the southeastern sky on the night of the 10th of October. This shower has a very low rate of 5 per hour under ideal conditions, but they are generally very bright and impressive. However, with the moon not setting until 4am, it might be better to try and catch the remnants of Comet Enka in the few hours before sunrise. Then we have the peak of the Delta Aurigids high overhead on the 11th and the Epsilon Geminids in the east on the 18th, but these have such low rates of indistinct meteors that will move straight onto the Orionids in the northeast on the night of the 21st. These are probably best observed before the moon rises around 9.30pm when you can expect to see fragments from Halley's Comet burning up brightly in Earth's atmosphere, shooting from the horizon up and outwards like fireworks. Okay, so before we go into the deep sky picks, let's first concentrate on an object of particular interest and share a few factoids that will either surprise or enlighten you. And this month, we're taking a look at Messier 44, or the Beehive Cluster. Okay, so fact numero uno, as Jen would say. 
Messier 44 is one of the closest open clusters to us and is clearly visible to the naked eye in moderately dark skies in the fake constellation Cancer. In fact, the cluster is often used to help find the constellation. Two exoplanets were discovered in the Beehive Cluster in 2012 around separate stars. These were the first planets detected around sun-like stars in an open cluster. Hmm. The Beehive Cluster is around 22 light years from end to end and appears to us as one and a half degrees across, making it a perfect binocular target. Ooh. Do you know, I didn't realise it was quite that big. It's huge, isn't it? It is. Exactly. That, that's, yeah, that's three times bigger than the moon. Mm. It's just quite di- uh, quite diffuse. No, not yes. diffuse. What's the word? Kind of... Um, it, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's say diffuse. Yeah. Sort of diffuse, yeah. Um, so M44 and the Hyades cluster share a common movement through space. Um, are roughly the same age, contain a similar makeup of white dwarfs, red giants and main sequence stars, suggesting they formed together and drifted apart or formed apart from the same gas and dust clouds. And final fact, if you take a look at the moon on the night of the 22nd of October this month, you'll see it occulting or covering the stars in the wider fringes of the Beehive cluster, so don't miss that. Oh, that's, that's good. I've seen that before mm. when it does that. It's really good. So, um, where to find it? So, this is one for the early risers at the moment, really. Um, as it's, um, and it's, it's often when the best skies and the clearest views to be had anyway. Um, it's one of those really easy but hard finds, bizarrely. <laughs> Cancer is a pretty indistinct constellation, frankly. It, it sits between the far more obvious Gemini and Leo. Looking between those two, you may actually catch sight of M44 by accident. So that's why I kind of say it's easy, because you kind of scan the sky and go, oh, there it is. Mm. You actually see the cluster before you see the constellation. It's averted vision is really good at seeing it. It allows the sort of the cluster to jump out. But as you, you kind of sweep the sky and you look directly at it, you lose it and it vanishes. Mm. So more officially, it sits in the centre of the constellation between stars Asalus Borealis and Asalus Australis, which are the two centre stars of the constellation once you've found it. So turning to objects further afield, what do we suggest for your optical or astrophotographic delight in the deep sky this month, Paul? Well, I'm going to suggest you take advantage of Aquarius, which will be dominating the southern sky underneath Pegasus Andromeda. Low, but pretty much as good as it gets in northern skies. My two picks to hunt down is constellation, a very large and bright glob and a fun planetary. So starting with the glob, if you find the star Beta Aquarii, the right-hand star of the brightest pairing in the constellation, then move your scope towards Enif in Pegasus. Five degrees above Beta, you will locate Messier 2, one of the largest globular clusters known. It's 33,000 light years away and at magnitude 6.3 is on the edge of naked eye visibility. Um, some people claim to see it after say, I, mm. I, I, I can't mm. um, this is one of the standout globs available in the northern hemisphere but because of its altitude it's quite low it's rarely get to look in with the likes of M13 and 15 getting much sort of higher billing mm. but do take a look because actually really it's more impressive next we're going on to hunt down a planetary nebula in the form of NGC 7009 nicknamed the Saturn Nebula there's a small planetary like this has two small lobes that allow it to do a half decent impression of everyone's favourite ring world. <laughs> this is not always an easy find. Low in the sky and in a patch of sky not overly populated with bright stars. So begin at Beta Aquarii or Saddlesund and then find Epsilon Aquarii or Abali to the right. Below and between them is the star 13 Aquarii. Move about two degrees back towards Epsilon and you should find it. Um, or as Ralph says, you should go to. Um, <laughs> it is a difficult one to find, actually. It, it is um, it's, it's the great the, the my Astro Camp story when Sky at Night came along, um, and I was looking for the Saturn Nebula, and they wanted to film me drawing it, and they ambushed me while I was actually in the process of trying to find it <laughs> manually, and they said, right, oh, quick, what are you what are you drawing now? We're filming, and <laughs> so I basically started to draw the Saturn Planetary Nebula on my on my sketch pad while they were filming. <laughs> <laughs> and there was nothing literally because it's such a bare patch of sky there was literally nothing in my IP. just doing not it from even, memory not even a field star <laughs> I was just making it up <laughs> that that's it is it, 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 yeah I, lo- I always love that it's like, like oh what are you looking at the eyepiece I'm looking at the eyepiece thinking there's absolutely f- in here <laughs> anyway don't overlook by the way a near, another globular cluster that's nearby it's M72 mm. if you want to track that down that's also nice but that's a bit smaller and not, not quite as spectacular as M2 Ralph 
For deep sky objects, you'll want to concentrate on the beginning and ends of the month when the moon will be more scarce. And as autumn's now upon us, it's a great time to point out the two brightest galaxies outside our own Milky Way and her satellites. That's the Andromeda and Triangulum galaxies. Both are sitting nice and high as soon as it's dark. The Andromeda galaxy is the brightest and clearly visible as a large smudge below the W-shaped constellation Cassiopeia. It'll already be 40 degrees high in the northeastern sky by 8pm at the beginning of October, and the Triangulum galaxy will be directly below some 25 degrees above the horizon. Both get higher as the night and month go on, and therefore better for observing. Both are spiral galaxies, clearly in photographic images, making them ideal astrophotography targets. With Andromeda, you're looking at a galaxy of a trillion stars, showing as a bright core and distinctive dust lane through the middle in medium to large-sized scopes. You should also look for the two brightest satellite galaxies, Messier 32 and Messier 10, allowing you to bag three Messier objects in one eyepiece. Triangulum is a touch further away at 2.7 million light years, but with an estimated 40 billion stars, a similar velocity and proximity to the Andromeda galaxy, it might actually be a giant satellite of the Andromeda galaxy. Being a little dimmer at magnitude 5.7, the Triangulum galaxy requires more patience or a larger scope to see the details in the spiral arms, making this a popular astrophotographic target. To finish, we have the moon this month, which begins with first quarter on the 5th, full on the 13th, last quarter on the 21st, and new on the 28th. Clear skies, and happy hunting. Okay, so for this month's question, we're going back to our astro roots and paraphrasing a telescope advice question from our good friend Jeremy Hansen in Wisconsin, who asks, was thinking about getting a 12-inch Dobsonian telescope. I have a 3-inch, but I want to see more than just Saturn and Jupiter. Is this a waste of money? Plus, don't feel you can control the movement as fine as the one I have. So there's quite a lot to take in here. Now, what I would say is mm. go back over some of our podcast extras. I think there was one in 2016 or 2018 that we did on how to buy, on the considerations for when you're buying a telescope. And that'll give yeah, you yeah. probably the best part of 45 minutes of us just talking about the considerations Scopes. for buying a new scope. Mm. But in short, there's a few considerations that, that you can take into account whenever you're looking at either buying a first telescope or upgrading a telescope, aren't there? There is. People always ask me this when I'm out and about. Oh, what, what scope should I buy? I want, and it is that kind of what what is it you want to do? What what kind of astronomy are you looking to do? So, are you are you, do you just want to look? Are you wanting to take astrophotography? Are you wanting to do planetary? Are you wanting to do deep sky? A bit of both. That you know, are you just happy with planets and the moon? The, 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 and there's different scopes that are better for each of those things. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, where are you observing? Now, you know, I, as you guys say, I, you know, I used to live in a pokey little place in, in London and I had no storage space. So you have to consider where you're going to put the darn thing when you're not using it. Because mm. the thing is, however much you want to, most of the time a scope is not being used. And it requires storage space. So 12-inch Dobsonians are brilliant scopes, but they're also quite large. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're not easy to, to kind of store. Yeah. So, you know, you're going you're gonna to take up space with those. So there's that. Where are you observing? If you've got a tiny backyard and a sucking great 12-inch Dobsonian, it actually might not be practical. Whereas if you've got a nice big garden, then... Or a shed like John. Yeah, exactly. Then and why not? Um, there's the portability issue. Because, of course, if your back garden's unsuitable, or you don't have one even for, for observing, then you're going to want to take your scope somewhere. You want to transport it away somewhere. My standard scope in, in, in London was a little five-inch back. Take that anywhere. Yeah, yeah, I used to take it on the underground. It's light and it's small. But a 12-inch exactly. job, you've got to have either a pickup truck or um, uh, what do they call a state car, station wagons, Yeah, you need, uh, you need to be able to carry a, it around. A big-sized family car, really, for, for a 12-inch Dobsonian. I mean, I, my, my largest I use is a 10-inch, and I get away with it in a, in a sort of, what for the UK is a, a kind of average-sized family car. 
But once you start getting bigger than 10 inches, it, it is, it's getting to be a sizable scope. Mm. Um, and it's more about the mount with a Dobsonian. It's not actually the tube, because if you can get a, a, a truss that you can actually break down or you know, a sort of flexi tube type things that Skywasher do that, that sort of compress, that's, that's easy. I, I use a 10 inch flexi tube now, which is, it gets quite small. It's the mount, that IKEA cupboard at the bottom. Mm-hmm. You can't do anything with it. It is yeah. just what it is. It's massive. Yeah. It has um, to be. Yeah. Um, and but I, th- I think that also you raise a good point yourself, uh, Jeremy, in when you mention about controlling the movement and it won't be as mm. fine with a a twelve inch dob as it will be with a three inch scope. That's absolutely right because there's no weight to it. You can have a a throw about tripod for your uh, for your three inch which means it'll just it'll move wherever you want it to go um, whereas a 12 inch Dobsonian has got a lot of weight to it so unless you've got really really good bearings um, to be able to make those those small adjustments with ease or if you've got a go-to for it but a go-to for a 12 inch Dobsonian is going to be pretty expensive Oh, they get they get pricey. Yeah. Um, I, it, it takes practice. It takes practice. I I made the move to Dobsonians, and it takes a bit of getting used to. I used to use small scopes and you know, max and fracs and things, you know, little things. And you do you get that nice little fine control. You're on a tripod. You have got that little handle. You know, like an AZ4 or something like that. And you've got those little fine movements you can make with your hand. As you say, they're nice and light. There's little you get used to that and then you've got this socking great drum under your arm with a big handle um, on a big turntable and it takes a bit of use to it but once you get used to it actually you can do fine control with a Dobsonian yeah it just takes practice yeah I mean if basically watch watch John with his 16 inch scope and he's he's putting on you know as much fine control as someone with a little 3 inch frag yeah you see him do his Macarian's chain trick. You know, that takes a little fine motor control. It, it, it is possible, but it just takes practice. Yeah. It does take practice. It's a different type of scope. I was just going to argue that actually you've got a longer lever, so you, you make larger movements and move across less areas of sky. You can, mm. but then you also... It's more kind of... Um, um, oh, what's the word? The... It's a bit more sticky, if you like. So, whereas you can make a really precise movement on a small scope, particularly if you've got a yes. pan uh, pan tilt tripod with a, a larger scope like yours, I always find that when I'm trying to recenter an object, you have to kind of pull it further away than and then you want back. it to be, so it can kind of twang back to center it yeah. in a sense. Yeah, there is a bit of backlash in some of the ways. Backlash, that's the word, yeah. The, the, the thing that still happens, I've been using Dobbs for years now, and then the thing that does happen is you do say, ah, oh, f- every so often, as you're moving it around, and you do, you get that kind of, it sticks. Yeah. And of course it's big, so you're putting pressure on the end of a long pole. So when the pressure gives, you move a lot further than you ever meant to. Yeah. And you do a lot of, oh, bugger, and then you, you sort of bring it back again. You, you, you're back to the star you were jumping from, and, yeah. and, and you do that more often than you do with a small scope. Yeah. That's true. Is it a waste of money? I'd say the thing is you, you, you've got to answer all those questions. Where are you observing? What is it you want to do? Where are you going to store it? If you've got good storage, a good place to observe it, a good way of transporting it around, then a 12-inch Dobsonian is a brilliant scope. It's also worth saying... The light gathering potential of a twelve inch oh. dob compared to a three inch, you are gonna find objects are huge Dumb. by comparison. Yeah. And that doesn't matter whether it's details of lunar surface details or whether it's galaxies. You will see galaxies mm. you couldn't even imagine were there if you were looking no, through a three inch exactly. scope. However, light pollution will just be amplified exactly the same so a Dobsonian yeah. will not cut through light pollution better than a 3 inch refractor you will not get any better light gathering in either scope no. um, or, or rather any better cutting out the light pollution you'll need filters for that regardless of what you got but a light bucket will gather just as much extra light pollution as it will gather extra photons from faint fuzzy objects yeah, I mean that, that's a big jump. That's a big jump. I mean, it, 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 you would you notice such a huge difference. So, I, I mean, I often said uh, if you're going to make a jump in size of scope, you should make two jumps to really see the difference. Because if you've got a a six inch scope, don't buy an eight inch. Yeah, 
go to a 10 because hmm. you, you won't see much difference between 6 and 8. Yeah. And similar with with an 8. If you've got an 8, don't go to 10. Go to 12 because you, you actually won't see a huge difference between But from a 3 to a 12. <laughs> but from a 3 to a 12. Exactly, I was going to say. You're going to feel like from, you've got Hubble there. You're, you're going to have your face sucked in through that eyepiece because <laughs> <laughs> you, you're just going to have your head blown away. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but if, you, if you're going to go up in size and you, you're on your small scope, you know, go from a 3 to a 5. That's quite a big jump, actually, three to a five. If you if you ever look through a three inch and you look through a five inch, there's a huge difference. I would say double it. I would say always double it if you want to get that wow factor. So go from a three to a six or a five to a ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. But at a minimum, you don't want to go up just one size. Yeah. It's it. You are not going to notice enough difference for the amount of money you've you've just yeah. sort of splashed out. But I think um, the the one thing to say to kind of summarise is. Nobody can tell you what's right for you. Only you can tell yourself. And a, and a, I would say a good thing to do would probably be go to your local astronomical society. There must be dozens yeah. in Wisconsin. Um, go and take a look through the larger scopes compared to the smaller scopes. And there will always be a dob there just because people like making telescopes and you can make dobs um, quite easily. Um, yeah. So go, go and take a look or, or go to a star party because you'll only know what's right for you if you take a look for yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Try them out. They're, they're, they're generally a very friendly bunch. Don't tell my missus building them easy. It took me three months. <laughs> you enjoyed every minute of it, though. Oh, it was great watching that come together. Until you drilled a hole in the wrong part for your eyepiece. Jeez, one thing. <laughs> <laughs> you had one job. Well, I guess you've suffered enough. That's it. The end of the show. Go about your business and pay us no more heed. We don't mind if we're considered disposable, expendable. Here when you need us and out of mind when you don't. We'll be here to entertain and educate whoever dips in. And we don't get offended if you drop us like it's hot. Neglect to leave us a review. Or tell your friends about the show. Or forget about us altogether. Yeah, yeah, but. Get in touch with the show. Give us your questions. Talk to us on Twitter. Talk to us on Facebook. Give us a review. <laughs> Ralph goes to bed crying. <laughs> Think of him. <laughs> you can get hold of us on Twitter at Awesome Astropod. And our email is the show at awesomeastronomy.com. So until our space exploration show in the middle of the month, it's goodbye from Cydonia Base. Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Cydonia Base, end of transmission. <laughs>